Thank you, Dr. Lewis Hall and Governor Kemp. Now let's get started. As we think about the theme, the future is now, this next discussion will include some very innovative and thought leader millennials. With the fireside chat with millennial tech entrepreneurs, will you please welcome our moderator? He's the co-founder and CEO of TGS Holdings, a consumer lifestyle and hospitality company based right here in Atlanta, and a dynamic young leader who, uh, who am I am personally proud of and is poised for the future. I'd like to present to you Ryan Wilson. Good morning, how is everyone? I'm really excited to be here. I wanna first thank the NF NMSDC for inviting us to have this conversation. Uh, these are some of my friends that are coming to stage and so the conversation that we're going to have is going to talk about a lot of different things. But we're gonna talk about tech, how these entrepreneurs have raised capital, uh, some of the challenges associated with doing so, and then what the future looks like. And so without further ado, I'd like to invite the panelists to join me on stage. Sheena, Jasmine, Joey, and Sriranka. Please. How are y'all? Good, good. Good. So you, you all have very long bios, but for the sake of time, can you give us just an overview of what you do now and, um, and talk to us about how you got there? Jasmine, we can start with you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jasmine Crow. I'm the founder and CEO of Gooder. We are an Atlanta-based tech startup that is leveraging technology to combat hunger and food waste. Oh. Uh, hi, I'm Srikant. I know we are short on time, but there are a few people that I would like to thank before we just go out there. Uh, firstly, I would start with NMSDC, I program. I'm not sure how many are familiar with I. I stands for Emerging Young Entrepreneur. I'm a 2017 graduate. Thank you, Lasonia Barry, for uh, supporting us uh, and uh, helping us on all the way. And I would like to thank Melissa and uh, uh, Dominic Milton, CVMS VC President, for enrolling me into University of Richmond's uh, Executive Education. Thanks, Dominion, for sponsoring that. And thanks, AT&T, for uh, your year-long mentorship. And uh, this year, I was at uh, Kellogg AMEP. Uh, without that education, I would have been never able to negotiate a $4 million investment into my company at a valuation of $60 million. Uh, so so it, it's, it's all... Uh, I believe that NMSDC is uh, one of their pillar uh, to be uh, developing. I was one of the live examples. Uh, thanks, Dominion. Thanks, uh, MetLife, for inviting us to your innovation lab uh, and uh, making us to speak with your corporate executives. And thanks, Sonoko, for your Sonoko leadership program. Uh, and uh, by the way, I'm Srikant Kodeboina, founder and CEO of Blue Eye Soft Corp, an advanced data analytics company focusing on predictive analytics and uh, specialized in uh, privacy protection of data. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Sheena Allen. I'm the CEO and founder of Capway. Capway is a untraditional financial ecosystem. At the core, what we do is mobile banking, but it's about actually building entire, we're building an entire financial ecosystem um, and creating financial opportunities for everyone. Uh, good morning, everyone. I am Joey Womack, uh, founder of Goody Nation, and we have a new initiative called the Intentionally Good Project to connect uh, Atlanta's top diverse-led startups as well as social impact startups to corporations for short pilots, to investors for capital, and to influencers for key endorsements or key advisors' roles and also endorsements. Joey, I'm going to come back to you, and we'll work our way this way. Why did you start Intentionally Good and, and Goody Nation? Why was that work important to you? Yeah, so what we saw in Atlanta typically is that diverse-led startups, and so we'll define that for this year as like either black-led, uh, Latinx-led, or women-led, and also social impact startups typically receive funding about two venture investment levels lower than where their progress indicates. And so, for example, if they're trying to raise like a million-dollar pre-seed or seed round, typically they're, having to, they're forced to raise money from family and friends at like a $25,000, $50,000 level. And, and really that's because of lack of access to high power social network. And so we set out to kind of solve it by kind of hacking the social network gap. Christina, same question to you. 
how did how did Capway find you, or how did you find Capway? <laughs> um, so Capway is my second startup, but uh, I started this company. I'm from Mississippi, a little small town in Mississippi, and it was only one town and one bank in my town. And so most people use predatory options, payday lending, check cashing. And what I noticed was that we are moving to a cashless economy. So you, know, you can't pay cash for Netflix, Spotify. And so you have 55 million people in America who are unbanked, underbanked, financially underserved. And the opportunity that I saw was the next generation of millennials and Gen Z are going to need plastic to participate in the economy that what we're going, going into now. And a lot of the bigger banks, even though they had programs for, I would say, financially underserved, a lot of it was like more of an afterthought or a department. I want to build a company from the ground up by really understanding the audience and giving them the tools that they needed. Thank you. Uh, so I personally used my initial earnings up there. Uh, later, I went to a non-conventional route, uh, applied for SBIR grants for the product development and research. Uh, so Department of Energy, and then uh, actually gave us uh, some initial funding. Uh, we are a South Carolina Research Authority SE launch company. Uh, so they invest in some of the best companies uh, within South Carolina. So I use some of their initial funding. And of course, consulting and regular services help. Uh, thanks to Beatrice for her first check. I think that was very motivating. Uh, <laughs> so the president of FSMSDC actually uh, gave a big boost uh, with her. I was just sitting up on one of this event at a dinner table and said that, hey, can you do this? I said yes, and then she helped me. So self-funding, uh, bankers, and then uh, state funding. Yeah, so I think what led me to starting Gooder is really just an organic experience of feeding people that were experiencing homelessness and hunger right here in Atlanta when I first moved here in 2013. And so I was doing that for about three and a half years. A video of one of my pop-up restaurants went viral on Facebook, and people were saying, this is so amazing, who donated the food, and the reality was nobody. I was couponing, price matching. I always say I'm the reason Walmart doesn't price match anymore. And I was cooking all this food and then taking it out to feed people. And people were saying, who donated the food? And it just was an aha moment for me. I started researching food waste, really became upset with just how much perfectly, food, perfectly good food goes to waste, why so many people go hungry. And that was kind of what led me to starting Gooder. So the, you mentioned the first check. And that, that oftentimes for entrepreneurs, that is the first initial hurdle past the ideation stage. How did, how did you uh, raise that first round of, of capital to start your projects? Uh, it, it, it's basically, it starts with your uh, networking and relationship. So you need to sell yourself out there. So having a good bio be behind the scenes saying that, you know, I was a program manager for a corporate Fortune 100 company. So you have to sell your past experience. Uh, as a millionaire, we may not have a long uh, work experience or history, uh, but uh, my previous, I started working at 17. And uh, I, I had 18 people working for me uh, when I was just like 19 years. So all of my previous experience, starting pretty young, always helps you. And there are always kind people. Uh, you'll be hearing a lot of no's uh, before they just say yes. And uh, if you do a better job, I think that can actually keep, keep you continuing up. Uh, yeah, first tech is always memorable. Got it. Joey, can you tell us how you, how you raised capital? Yeah, I'm a little bit different um, in that, you know, my organization serves other entrepreneurs, but in my former life as a startup, I mean, I raised family and friends around from basically my frat brothers, quite honestly. Um, and now when we go about kind of helping other entrepreneurs, it's really, it's really about an intentional effort. So it's, it's a cultural thing. So how can we be intentional about helping um, startups like Jasmine and, and Sheena, you know, raise money? Uh, by putting them in the room with people that have graduated from prestigious universities, um, that have that have or that either work for or are alumni from really really good companies, and let them use their network to to talk to investors. Awesome. And so Sheena and Jasmine, you both have raised capital too, but have done so in rather untraditional ways. Can you talk to us about that process? Yeah, I think for the very first year, all of the capital I brought in was actually prize money from pitch competitions. Um, I didn't have access to a network. Even after I met Joey, it was still really hard through all of 2017 getting in front of people that could actually invest in me. My parents had just gotten divorced. My sister had just got graduated from Spelman. So my internal family network was really tapped out. And so I started entering pitch competitions and used that prize money to really fuel me for a whole year and actually build the technology that I was speaking about in those pitches. Um, 
For me, uh, that first round was hard because when I was pitching to mainly VCs in like Silicon Valley, New York, I had a lot of VCs who actually didn't believe that people in like 2017 were like unbanked. Like they were like, there's no way that people don't have bank accounts. And so that was, that was the biggest challenge, to be 100% honest. Um, so I went back to people who I knew would get it, and then they would understand the biggest competitive advantage that we had, which was, I, not only did I understand technology, I had built a successful technology company before this one, but I had the advantage of understanding the people I was serving. So I think a lot of people know there's a problem in this market and they can research and understand it, but to truly understand the people is a totally different ball game. And I grew up in that community. I, that was my grandmother, that was my aunt. And so to put those two together was my biggest competitive advantage. I had to find investors who understood that. I went through a different route on there because capital mostly depends upon the credibility that you have. So when I started my company, I did not have any credibility. I was an young guy. Uh, what I did was that I went to the State Department of Commerce of the state government and told them that I'll be creating 120 jobs within the next five years. Uh, I got a free publicity, uh, so all the newspapers were up there. I, of course, it took me two months to convince that I have the capability to create that 120 jobs. Uh, Governor of South Carolina gave a press release. And then the next day, I have uh, the VP of uh, TD Bank and the Chase Bank coming to my office and asking, what do you need? I got a 100K line of credit, and I said that I need all the three banks up. Uh, so that's how I got my initial thing. I did not dilute my company. I'm still 100% owner up there. So I, I've got to ask for you to share some of your secrets with us. I, the next thing I want to transition to is there are a lot of representatives here from, from large organizations. What traits or skills do you feel like you had in order to be able to better work with those organizations, especially early? Like how did you convince them to do business with you? Oh, um, for me, well, for Capway, um, we're more of a B2B to C company. And what happened was we were, we were talking to major corporations, like retailers, service providers, um, different sectors, and what they were realizing was in order to grow, to continue to grow in America, you're gonna have to find a way to touch people who are unbanked, underbanked, financially underserved, or you're not gonna grow. I mean, there's only so much you can do with the other side. And most of those corporations just don't really know how to touch or penetrate that market. And so as a B2B, B2B C company, we have the market, we understand the market, and they need the market. So we're kind of that middle point of bringing everybody together so that everybody wins in the end. Yeah, I found a lot of success in educating the customers on really what it is that we did. And so customers would say, like SAP is one of our customers. And I remember when I first met with their sustainability director in Germany, who said, well, we're a technology company. And I said, yeah, but you have 100,000 employees and a lot of your offices serve food. And you are stating that you are part of the sustainable development goals. You're gonna reduce your waste. You're gonna lead a more sustainable business. You need to really be looking at food waste. It's the number three thing that can affect climate change. And they didn't understand that. And so when I started to show them and say, let's come in and do a waste audit, and they started to see how much food they were wasting and that there was a tax savings opportunity there, then I started to get more ears to listen, but a lot of it was educating people that food waste is a problem and that in your community too many people go hungry and showing them that there was a real opportunity to have not only a corporate social responsibility story, but an opportunity to really reach your sustainability goals, be able to put this in your sustainability reports, save money affecting your bottom line, and then be able to empower the people in your community. And once they got that, I think we started getting more traction. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I think that um, one of the things that we see is, that, again, as we connect diverse led startups to corporations for their first pilot, is that corporations come back constantly and say, it's all about trust. Do we trust the entrepreneurs? Can I put my relations or my reputation on the line for them? And so oftentimes that trust is about those that soft skills, right? So are they not going to go around me if things are moving not as, as fast in the corporation? Or can they pitch to executives? Do they have executive presence? You know, can they follow up via email in a very kind of corporate and succinct way, get straight to the point? But also, and this is a great thing that we heard a lot of feedback from Jasmine um, on, is their ability to kind of wow an audience through, through storytelling, right? Can you tell an amazing story in a very, very short amount of time? And so those, those are kind of some of the traits that we see that's led to a lot of success. And so we've connected, um, 
played a role kind of in Jasmine getting connected to the airport, but also now we're starting to see our efforts being um, deployed in Porsche and Delta and a few other companies as well. Awesome. As far as challenges go, though, what have been some of the challenges of working with these, these uh, larger organizations? One of the key challenge would be like, uh, especially to the tech millennial entrepreneurs or the minority related uh, persons would be that, you know, you will be always dealing with a 45, 50 year old guy who is the decision, key decision maker and you are a millennial. You just go and say, guys, what you're doing is crap. You need to try innovative way or we'll be doing this. There are a number of politics behind the scenes which always before you get a contract check. But uh, with avenues like NMSDC, we were able to at least get some meetings up there. Uh, but convincing them that you know we can do some th some innovative solutions which not major corporations do is a real big challenge. Making them believe that you know a 30 year old guy can come and solve a big problem is within your innovation lab is 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 pretty hard. But uh, I believe if you do some niche areas and things, I think that's how we are trying to overcome that. Uh, but again, age and uh, the way you speak and others, there are multiple barriers. Now, I'll say age does play a role. I mean, it's kind of hard when you walk into a room and you're like 29 and 30. You're like, I had this whole mobile banking like ecosystem that can change your entire corporation. They're like, I have kids older than you. <laughs> like, what? Um, so I think, I mean, but when you talk numbers and you prove out your, your product, things change. But it, sometimes the age thing is a, a stepping stone. Here I would just request the corporate clients. I know that uh, the VPs and the executives who makes the decisions, I know you want to keep your job safe, but at least give some opportunities for at least one folk. Inviting us to your meetings always helped us, but at least give two or three people an opportunity. Uh, personally, MetLife has done a great job uh, inviting uh, six of our minority businesses to come and pitch in out there. Whether we win or lose the contract, at least being called to those companies means a lot for us especially small businesses and minorities. Just give us some seat and then give us one opportunity and then we'd be able to show a little bit of difference. And uh, three and a half a million is nothing for your billion dollar businesses. <laughs> give it a try. I would say, Ryan, it's sometimes hard just to get into the room. I think that's, you know, so for Gooder, we were really intentional about becoming an MBE and, a, and making sure that we had our DBE and we were WBE and so we did all of these things and then sometimes it was really just a challenge to actually get a meeting. So I would employ everybody in here that has the ability to help startups get to the table to really do that because we would send the emails, you know, you'd meet somebody at a supplier diversity conference, you get their email, you go in, you fill out the long supplier diversity <laughs> registration application, and then you wait for those RFPs and you wait for those opportunities. But it's a challenge when you are a small startup and every single day that you're in business, you know, you're spending money, you're paying people, and so you're really thinking, I need to close deals, I need to get my sales, this revenue has to come in so that I can be in business long enough to get your opportunities. And sometimes those opportunities are really slow to actually close. Absolutely. Yeah, so so one of our, our, our partners, Engage, and so for those that know, Engage uh, basically is an investment venture capital firm that connects startups in general, uh, really across the Southeast to corporations and, and their investors in the fund are some of Atlanta's largest corporations. And so, what they said to me recently is that they feel like uh, corporations are like, spend like 99% of their time on defense. With startups, we spend like 99% of our, our time on offense, so to speak. And like for us, it's like fourth and goal every day and two minutes to go, right? And so, uh, and we're down by like 20 points. And so uh, there's that, this is that disconnecting kind of perspective and, and culture, and so it kind of creates this clash whether it kind of goes out in age or you have to fill out like tons and tons of forms. And so that's kind of the largest uh, kind of challenge that we see in helping startups understand the culture and then vice versa, helping, helping corporations understand the culture of startups and how they may be able to uh, kind of uh, get over it moving forward. I, I love that analogy. I think it's more like 30 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, th there's been a lot written about the, the ecosystem here in Atlanta specifically. Uh, Fast Company, Inc., USA Today, over the last couple of months have been writing about what's happening here. What do you think that we're getting right about tech in Atlanta? And where do you see the, this community moving forward? I'll start yeah, with. I think for, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of different things kind of bubbling up. It's a great time to be in Atlanta. Um, sorry, one, you're starting to see a shift toward 
or the collision course between technology and music, film, art, and just general kind of entertainment and culture. Um, two, you're starting to see a lot of companies or startups move toward uh, profitability as being their main goal, trying to become 20, $30 million startups instead of kind of burning out and trying to get to the billion dollar uh, phase. And so that often means that people are kind of incorporating some of the skills that they learn in, in business school, quite honestly. And also you're starting to see a lot, a lot more corporations, and this is not a, a plug, quite honestly, but use kind of supplier diversity as a way to create wealth, wealth for diverse led startups as give, and using them as that reference customer so that they may be able to kind of springboard some more opportunities moving forward. I would say that I think the problems that we're solving are really unique. Um, speaking from someone who's in the social impact space in all the articles that I've been referencing that you just mentioned, it was about taking this simple idea to solve a really big problem and looking at how we could first solve that in Atlanta and then go and take that at scale. So I think it's been a very unique kind of pitch in all these different problems that we're solving out of Atlanta. It's been a big one. Yeah, I'll piggyback off that. So I'm not from Atlanta. I moved to Atlanta earlier this year. Um, but my company was actually in Silicon Valley before we came to Atlanta. But the ecosystem and why I chose Atlanta was why well, Silicon Valley is, is amazing. You, you know, you get your resources there. There's a lot you can build from there. I chose Atlanta because of the ecosystem of, one, you can build much leaner here. So it, it doesn't cost as much to run a company here. But for two, I could, people, the ecosystem of building a tech here understands real world problems on a different level than Silicon Valley understands real world problems. So to be able to go somewhere and still do tech and still be able to build, um, still a lot of finance goes on here, it's a huge payments hub. Um, it was a great place to come to truly build a company where people understood exactly what you were doing and they understood real world problems and helped to, to build that company. So I pick, uh, I pick Tech Bar, I traveled 43 states in America as a consultant. Uh, and then I finally called uh, South Carolina as my home uh, for my office out there. It's a tech barren land. Within South Carolina, you don't find many technology companies. Uh, so when I was the guy who was offering uh, tech-related jobs, which are high paying, about six figure, uh, then the state all uh, came supporting us. They paid half of the salaries what they did. And uh, we always chattered uh, niche areas out there, uh, trying to enter into the space market or uh, trying to provide privacy protection of data. Uh, so through global partnerships, uh, I was able to bring attention of uh, Inc. and other major papers, uh, and uh, even on the space. So we're, we're almost out of time. The, the last topic I want to move to is just sharing um, with the organizations that are here some of the, the, the things that you'd wish they understood about the businesses that you operate. Um, I think there are a lot of misconceptions with us being younger entrepreneurs um, about what it is that we do and why we do it. So what would you share with the room um, with, in terms of um, things, misconceptions and things that you wish that were just understood better? I'll throw it back down there. You start first. <laughs> okay, yeah, so I would, I would like businesses to understand that they really have an opportunity to play a vital role in social change. And so we spend a lot of money on a lot of things in our business. So whether that's marketing, whether that's events, breakfasts, team dinners, but we have 42 million people that are gonna go to bed hungry tonight, and they're gonna wake up tomorrow morning still hungry, often not knowing when and where their next meal is coming from, while all the while at some place in your business, perfectly good food is going to waste. And you have a real opportunity to change that, change outcomes for people around you, and that you really need to start looking at the social changes that you make because the millennials, we are coming next year, we'll make up more than 50% of the entire workforce and we care about supporting businesses that are doing the right thing and that that is going to become more and more important as you advance. It's no longer about how much money you're making, it's about what you're doing that's good and I want businesses to understand that doing the right thing has to happen and it needs to start happening with more businesses. Uh, I just wanted to say when it comes to the misconception, I just wanted to say that, you know, small business can, businesses can do really big things. Corporates, please understand that, you know, uh, you, you, you would, you would uh, see something big, good, good things coming out of small businesses, which you might have never ever seen from a large corporation. So I just say that, you know, never judge uh, depending upon your size or the capability. It's all about trusting and believing. Um, I would say that as 78% as of all American workers are living paycheck to paycheck. Is that next generation kind of, as Jasmine said, 
um, the millennials and Gen Z are coming up, the issues that they're going to have, they're not going to run to a traditional bank to solve it. They're going to run to something way more innovative. And the companies that are going to be innovative are going to be built by people that look like them, that are, are that's their age, and those are the companies that we are building. So to keep that in mind is that next generation is coming up and they're already struggling anyway. Um, I like to say that you know, we all have a role to play in solving some of the world's toughest problems. We, we literally, everybody in this room has a, has a role to play. And so I think, like, like kind of selfishly for folks in this room, if you're on a pathway to making $200,000 a year personally or $300,000, I believe it's like the threshold to be, uh, for a household to be an accredited investor, like there, use the opportunity to learn from startups and evaluate them so that you may then start to become investors yourself. I mean, on a kind of a, somewhat of a pseudo-professional level. And so kind of leverage the companies to learn for yourself, uh, and also is a great way for corporations to kind of increase employee engagement. Awesome. And final note, I, I have to ask, where can we find you? This is a very millennial question. How can we contact you uh, moving forward? I'm Jasmine Crow on everything. Simple and easy. At, at Jasmine Crow. At Jasmine Crow. Okay. Just Google Shrikan, South Carolina. <laughs> Um, capway.co.co and email is Sheena, S-H-E-E-N-A, at capway.co. Um, Goody Nation on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and then personally for me on LinkedIn, Joey Womack. I want to thank all of you. Uh, thank you for your leadership and the businesses that you you're, uh, have started or are changing the world. So appreciate you being here this morning. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you.